All right, thanks everyone for joining our webinar, The Evolution of Penetration Testing, Moving in the Industry Forward, presented by David Kennedy. My name is Chris Besch, and I'm the VP of Sales and Marketing at Trusted Sec. Before I introduce Dave, I wanted to touch on a couple items. First, we recently wrote two blogs that complement the webinar. The blogs are titled, Penetration Testing Has Gotten Tougher, and Why That Increases Your Risk, and also, From Scans to Adversary Emulation, Pen Testing is Evolving Rapidly. The blogs can be found on our website, and the links will be shared in the chat section of the webinar toolbar. Second, David will leave time for Q&A after the presentation. Please type any questions you have during or after the presentation in the questions section of the webinar, webinar toolbar. We'll try to get to all of them today, and if we can't, we'll send a follow-up to everyone who attended. You can also feel free to reach out to us directly after the webinar at info at trustedsec.com. Before Dave gets started, I'll briefly touch on his impressive background. David is the founder of TrustedSec, Binary Defense, and DerbyCon, which is a large-scale information security conference in the U.S. Prior to TrustedSec and Binary Defense, David was a chief security officer for Diebold Incorporated, a Fortune 1000 company located in over 80 countries with over 20,000 employees. David developed a global security program that tackled all aspects of information security. David is considered a forward thinker in the security field and has presented at hundreds of conferences worldwide. David keynotes numerous of the nation's largest conferences. Examples include Microsoft's Blue Hat, Black Hat, DEF CON, and Derby CON. David has had numerous guest appearances on Fox, CNN, MSNBC, The Katie Couric Show, just to name a few. Additionally, his tools have been featured on a number of TV shows and movies, including on the History Channel and Mr. Robot. David has testified in front of Congress on multiple occasions regarding the threats we face in security and in the government space. David also co-authored the book, Metasploit, The Penetration Tester's Guide, which was number one in security on Amazon for over a year. David was also one of the founding members of the Penetration Testing Execution Standard, or P-Test. P-Test is the industry leading standard and guide to how penetration tests and methodologies should be performed and has been adopted by the PCI DSS guidelines for penetration testing. David is a creator of several widely popular open source tools, including the Social Engineer Toolkit, Pen Testers Framework, Artillery, and Fast Track. David has also released security advisories, including Zero Days, and focuses on security research along with the research team he created at TrustedSec, led by Carlos Perez. Prior to the private sector, David worked in the United States Marine Corps for cyber warfare and forensic analysis activities for the intelligence community, which included two tours to Iraq. David is also on the board of directors for the ISC Squared organization. As you can tell, whether he's speaking on a panel, presenting to a board, keynoting conferences across the globe, David loves to give back to the security community. With that, let me turn it over to him. David? Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. And uh, good intro there. And I uh, appreciate everybody on the, the webinar uh, hopping on and listening to me talk for a little bit. Uh, definitely make sure that you uh, uh, hit the questions and answers uh, places. I'm happy to answer anything that we have going on there. And uh, let's get started. Uh, just a little bit about TrustedSec. Uh, I started TrustedSec, uh, I think, going on six years ago Wow, uh, from, from the basement of my house. And uh, it, it was funny because at the time, uh, when I started in the basement, I, I figured, well, hey, I don't need an office or anything like that. And I had uh, fresh twins that were, uh, I think, murdering each other upstairs. And so I decided to get a building. And since then, we've grown uh, to have a great reputation in the security industry. And it's it's really been a pleasure working with uh, some of my best friends and uh, coworkers within the industry. We're all peers here uh, at Trusted Sec. And so a little bit about ourselves. We focus on everything from penetration testing, zero-day research, adversarial simulation, forensics and instant response, uh, web application security. You name it as far as the technical side, but we also have a whole different group focusing on uh, our GRC practices, everything from being QSAs that do PCI work, uh, all the way over to performing risk assessments and maturity assessments for organizations. Whatever we can do to help the industry move forward and, and help customers get better at what they're doing. And that's really been our focus is on our partners and, and most importantly, our friends, uh, what we do. Our model is always do the right thing, and uh, we always try to do what's right for our customers and, and for our friends and, and family. I also started a second company, uh, Binary Defense, uh, a number of years ago, and this has been a great success for us. We're a 24-7 security operations center, but we also uh, make our own endpoint detection response tool uh, called Vision. And uh, what's been interesting about that is we just made Gartner's 
uh, uh, area for the managed detection response and endpoint detection response uh, guidelines, which is really awesome and, and a good testament to see. It's been fun focusing on both red and blue, and that's really where a lot of my uh, passion comes from is, is understanding how we can best get into organizations and circumvent their security just as much as attackers would, but at the same time, also understand how we can best secure our organizations and our enterprises to make sure that they are, are stronger and can withstand attack or at least get better at detection, which is going to be a big focal point uh, of where we're at today and kind of the maturity level of the information security industry. And so uh, working both at Binary Defense and TrustedSec, it's been a great, great experience and uh, get to learn so much from so many talented people. And also the folks in the security industry have been absolutely amazing. Uh, so again, I appreciate everybody hopping on uh, the webinar and hopefully you learned something new uh, going through this. So this is one of my favorite topics, uh, uh, penetration testing in general. I, I started off my career uh, working for the intelligence community, uh, doing offensive operations. And what's interesting about, if you look at and when I first started into this, this industry, uh, about you know your, two, your year 2000 is when I joined the Marine Corps. And um, it's been interesting to see the evolution around where everything is kind of heading uh, and where it was in the past. And I think if you look at where penetration tests first started off on, it was really focused on uh, understanding as many exposures as we, as we possibly could find, testing our incident response programs. And I think a lot of the things that we saw originally would, was that we'd go into an organization, uh, you'd, you'd attack them, you'd find a number of different weaknesses, you'd get access to their most sensitive data, and you'd walk out handing a report saying, hey, here's all the things you're doing wrong, and, and get better by fixing these different issues. And what we've seen over just the past few years, it's only been the past couple of years, is really an evolution of that where it's not just going in and finding the different exposures, it's how can we get better both at protection and defense uh, and, and responding to those specific threats in a way that, that makes it better. And that's where I think penetration testing is continuously evolving into, and there's a number of different ways of, of looking at this and tackling it. Uh, we'll definitely cover that as part of this engagement, uh, part of this webinar. Uh, but it's really just important to understand, at least starting off with, is that, is that understanding your risk as an organization uh, it really comes down to understanding what type of attackers you want to get after you, your defensive capabilities, and ultimately where you, where you should prioritize your efforts on uh, to really start to address uh, some of the concerns that we see today. And if you look at, and just starting off here, there's a huge gap in timing between protection, uh, our ability to protect an organization to when a specific threat comes out. And so let's, let's take a couple examples. Uh, let's just say a new zero day comes out today. Do you have the ability within your organization to make sweeping changes across your entire enterprise within a 24-hour period before exploitation occurs? Usually the answer to that is no. Uh, a good example is about a year, year and a half ago, a bunch of great security researchers came out with a new technique uh, called DD Auto, uh, which is a method for uh, getting code execution within Office documents uh, that um, didn't require macros, which is a common attack vector. And with that one specifically, it was weaponized in under 24 hours. So to fix that, it was, uh, there was no patch at the time. And so did, there was a couple of registry modifications that you can make that could go and do it. Did, did you as an organization have the ability to make those sweeping changes across your organization prior to uh, the ability to actively uh, stop that specific exposure? And usually the answer to that is no, protection takes time. So as, a, as an attacker, we have an advantage in a lot of cases around protection because it's, it's tr almost trivial for us in a lot of cases to get around a number of the different uh, techniques that they're leveraging, whether it's application whitelisting or application control, whether it's some next gen AV or whether it's uh, uh, a new, new type of tool that does behavior and machine analytics and artificial intelligence and everything else out there. Uh, to circumvent protection features is, is very, very trivial for most attackers. And, and that's something that we should strive for too. Uh, when we're trying to simulate attacks, having an understanding around the capabilities that an organization has and the ways that we can circumvent those, those pieces of technology or things that we should have in our arsenal. And I'll talk about that. But it's very difficult uh, for protection. And, and being in the EDR space ourselves, it's, it's very interesting to see like, hey, if we write something that's, that's good for one organization, well, in a second organization, uh, it can completely topple their, their, their company based off of how they use a specific application or tool. And so it's, it's really hard for companies that are doing protection and, and to be able to do these types of techniques to make sweeping changes across the board and so protection takes a long time. Now, if you look at, at where we're at now in detection, detection should be something extremely fluid, uh, something that's very easy for us to implement, to go through, and to really focus on uh, very fast. And so can we move very quickly in detection and say, okay, well, our time window for protection to actually stop some of this is six months because we have to go through a change advisory board, we have to go through a change control board, we have to get approval, we have to do testing and QA, uh, a number of different things that we have to, to do. Uh, and, and to get protection in place, but can we mitigate those those areas and say, okay, well, if we can't implement protection in an extremely fast-paced manner, can we at least detect attacks in the very early stages 
and then from there minimize the damage to the company. So if one person becomes compromised or two persons become compromised, it's a lot better than 100 or 1,000. And that's really where the, the, the maturity level has shifted because if you look at probably five to eight years ago, our main focus was locking down everything as possible. Can we create a castle that has a moat and a drawbridge and archers and knights that are protecting the, the environment and all of our intellectual property and creating all of these different environments and sandboxes and different ways to contain information? And what we found very quickly is that that the business was like, no, we're not we're not going to deal with a castle and have to give a blood sample to get access into our environment. Uh, we're going to, in fact, we're going to open up our drawbridges and we're going to partner with the towns next door, i.e., cloud and cloud computing, and we're going to focus a lot of our efforts on on trying to minimize the burden on an organization to move faster. Um, agile development came out, and so to produce code very quickly in a way that allowed us to start to do things. So all of these things occurred over a certain period of time, and penetration testing. Uh, didn't really evolve as fast with it. We we still we, we still focused on the types of recommendations of oh you need to lock this down more you need to do this you need to do that you need to put uh, network segmentation in place which by the way is a good practice and I highly recommend it. Um, there's a lot of things that that we started focusing on and became more of the showstoppers for organization than we did the promotion of of an organization its business and understanding that we have to move with them as well. And so if you look at that uh, in the security industry today, and, th and this is my, my obviously my personal opinion, but what we see most effective in, in the organizations that we do assessments for, especially folks that have gone substantially um, more mature over the past few years, that's very difficult for us to compromise. Detection has to become the largest priority in your enterprise. And, and understanding what types of attack patterns are out there um, is super important. Same thing as it goes on from, from a red teaming perspective, uh, if you're in the exploitation side actively going after systems and understanding new attack patterns and developing new attack patterns so that defenses can be uh, built off of that are super important. So all of these things have to come into play and we have to focus on building these out over time to get better at what we're doing. And if you look at attackers, I mean, they're focusing on legitimate behavior uh, to evade uh, detection. I mean, they're using RFC compliant protocols, they're using TLS, they're using DNS, they're using uh, normal command and control infrastructure that has randomized in interval beacons, looks like HTTP traffic, you name it. Our, our focus uh, is, is, as attackers is, is really shifting towards legitimate uh, uh, attacker techniques and evasion. And a lot of that has to do with where a lot of folks have, have sent their, uh, focused their efforts on, which has really been on the endpoints themselves. You look at compromising user accounts from there, moving laterally, post-exploitation scenarios. All of those have to emulate uh, legitimate behavior because a lot of endpoint detection uh, tools are coming out. Uh, log analysis is being, now being performed from those, and we're getting much better at understanding what those types of things look like. And so as attackers, we're focusing and shifting and continuously shifting our efforts on new techniques that haven't been discovered uh, or, or ways that we can emulate a user uh, attack uh, within an organization that doesn't trigger alarms or attacks. And so if you look at most organizations, and, and let's talk a, a second about threat modeling. Threat modeling is the practice of, of trying to build out and understand uh, what the capabilities of your adversaries or attackers are. And from there, taking those threats towards your organization and mapping those in a way that allows you to grow and build your security program over time. And so if you look at most organizations' threat models, they rely very heavily uh, off of a few different sources. Uh, one being automation tools, uh, tools that can simulate uh, specific types of attacks. So let's just say like uh, Caldera or the, the minor, from the minor attack framework, the Atomic Red Team stuff, some amazing stuff going on there. Um, as well as, as under, uh, looking at specific uh, tech, tactics, techniques, and procedures that we see or TTPs out there around uh, uh, very specific uh, pieces around threat intelligence. And what's interesting with, with most of the TTPs that organizations are receiving and doing is they build them off of those patterns. And a good example is I, I decided to take a look at a couple of EDRs uh, recently, and this was uh, when the CERT Util um, attack vector came out. And if you're not familiar, uh, kind of the, the, the lineage of, of attacks, um, executables are still a viable method for most organizations because they don't uh, block uh, traditional PE files uh, for most users. But some folks have gotten better at that and don't allow execution within user profile directories. Um, some folks do very good application whitelisting and control. And so attackers uh, a number of years ago uh, started focusing on PowerShell. PowerShell has gotten a lot better as far as the ability to log and, and do analysis on, especially with things like script block logging, integration into AMSI, the anti-malware scan interface, as well as a number of other features, especially with PowerShell version 5 and 6 and constrained language mode. PowerShell is becoming less and less of an ideal situation for us as attackers because of, of the amount of effort that they've put into visibility into a programming language. In fact, PowerShell is, is by far the most verbose programming language that is out there today. You look at Java, you look at Python, you look at, I won't, I won't mention Perl, it's not really a programming language, uh, just kidding everybody. Uh, Ruby, a few other ones, those are all different things that, that don't have the substantial amount of logging um, in environments. And so PowerShell 
while it's still actively used uh, in a lot of attacks, is being less and less used because the focus is, is, is focusing on areas that may not have good logging. Um, things like application control bypass techniques. There's a number of, of binaries within Windows um, that give you remote code execution capabilities um, that are code signed by Microsoft and allow you to execute code uh, without um, any substantial logging out there. And why that's important is that if you look at these, uh, this is where a lot of the EDR market, the endpoint detection and response tools, will focus on uh, detection of that. And as penetration testers, uh, the ability to attack organizations and identify those, we should, be, we should know what these are and test those out in our environments uh, to be able to identify uh, what's happening out there and try to simulate real world activities. But at the same time, if you look at how they focus on things and what, what where most people uh, focus on monitoring and detection, it's building out uh, signatures basically for these specific TTPs. And what's interesting about that is that it, to circumvent those are usually pretty trivial. I took a look at a lot of the uh, most recent EDRs out there. And uh, one of the ones that I took a look at uh, when CertUtil came out, there's a way to leverage CertUtil to download code um, and execute that, um, which is a, a, a tool for importing and exporting certificates. You can remotely download code and execute. Uh, with CertUtil, uh, what was interesting, it, it, they would look for very specific strings uh, being called within CertUtil. So if I modify that, if I throw, let's just say a caret, or I obfuscate that string in some way, shape, or form, they're not looking for a cert utility beaconing out to the internet. They're looking for very specific patterns and signatures. So if you're building your, your techniques and your defensive capabilities off of very specific strings, also from, from, a, from an attacker's perspective, those are things that we should definitely be simulating as an attacker to identify those and get around those to make their detection rules uh, better in, in most cases. And so we can learn a lot from TTPs, but without direct simulations, uh, falling behind becomes a reality. And I'll talk a little bit about the evolution around uh, where we've come from, from a penetration testing perspective, and then more getting into the collaborative approaches around red teaming and purple teaming. But what's interesting to see is that, you know, without, without actually simulating very specific attacks in your environment and building uh, detection criteria off of multiple phases of an attack, whether it's uh, exploitation, post-exploitation, persistence footholds, privilege escalation, lateral movement, all those different types of techniques. Uh, if we're not building out those capabilities, we're missing a substantial amount of information uh, that we can actively use to defend our companies. And if you look at the current state of detection, uh, I, I thought this one was, was kind of interesting. Uh, I wrote this tool uh, in 2012, so we're looking at uh, six years ago I wrote this. And this is an executable. Um, it's not signed. It is not code signed in any way, shape, or form. And it's a, it's a Python tool uh, that you can compile. Uh, and, and in there, it has a command and control infrastructure for AES over HTTP. And so with that, which was, what was interesting is that I wrote that uh, uh, six years ago. And um, I, have, I had a, in the example, I had an executable uh, that you can use in there. And it's been used before in the past for, for uh, attack vectors. And what was interesting is that I uploaded it to VirusTotal. And only six out of the 60, none of them being next generation AV, um, detected it as being malicious. And so most organizations rely very heavily off of these tools to, to, to be their protection. In most cases, they, they don't provide the level of, of attacks that are out there. I'd like to use another example. Uh, this is from Nick Carr. Uh, it's really Nick, I highly recommend following him and uh, 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 Daniel as well uh, from the FireEye crew. They're, they're fantastic. But what was interesting is um, Enigma, uh, Matt Nelson, uh, came out with a technique uh, that allowed you to embed uh, very specific types of code within uh, zip files. Um, and this one was, was, was interesting because um, it, this was two weeks after uh, the technique came out itself that you could get code execution both from web applications as well as through documents. Uploaded uh, one of the ones that, that he was testing out there, um, and it was just a, a pretty basic template um, off of the post from, from Matt Nelson. It uh, wasn't obfuscated or changed in any way, and uh, zero out of 60 were detecting it. So if you look at the tools, they're, they're behind when it comes to what they're looking for, and they take a while uh, to be up to date. And, and that's, that's a big concern that we have in the security industry because we can use these techniques as attackers uh, for a very finite window um, and leverage them for attacks. I mean, even HTAs you can still use, and those have been around since the late 90s. Um, there's a number of ways that, that we can still attack organizations, and that's a problem. And so if you look at the focus, um, we have to look at the, 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 the focus has to be more on behavior uh, versus pattern. Uh, a good example of, of some of these areas here uh, would be looking at uh, process trees and Markov chaining, so parent-child processes that are that are um, executing abnormally, or behavior in itself, where hey, we now have uh, office products going to IP addresses that they've never been associated to in the first place. See, those are probably things that we'd want to take a look at, or anything spawning uh, something from the command line, or going to folders of files that typically hasn't used before. More behavior-based in a lot of cases, and yeah, that's going to generate a lot of false positives. Um, but those are things that we have to sift through as as regular users, human analysts to be able to go and determine out there. 
Um, and what's interesting about purple team assessments is that they simulate true attack vectors in a lot of different areas, whether it's uh, simulating a phishing exercise, uh, we go through an attack uh, and we get command and control that way. These are all things that we can simulate and do that allow us to, to become much more effective in how we're actively going and defending against things. And so let's go through some key definitions because I think it's really important uh, to walk through terminologies before we actually talk about kind of the evolution of penetration testing. I think it's, it's super important. Definitions in our industry um, has been a, a problem for a number of years. Uh, we, we've heard penetration tests being, being masked as vulnerability assessments, red teams being masked as vulnerability assessments, red teams being masked as penetration testing, uh, threat hunting, all these different terms uh, out there in the industry with no clear direction or definition of those. And that's, that's something that, that I think we can do a lot better on uh, from a security industry perspective is really focusing on understanding what we define as specific things um, as, as a community, as a, as a profession, to be able to go through and do some of these things. And so let's talk a little bit about the blue team. The blue team uh, is, is really the defensive folks within an organization. Those are the folks that focus on understanding the uh, uh, attack patterns. They understand uh, how to try to protect the network itself and they're continuously trying to get better. Those are the folks that are your, your firewall admins, your, your desktop administrators, uh, your, your security operations center, uh, the threat hunting groups. These folks are, are, are the folks that are literally the, the defense of your, uh, of your company or organization. The red team is, is more designed to be a tactical um, type of group that un has very specific tradecraft um, that can build capabilities based off of threat models of your organization, uh, probes to understand where those are and tries to circumvent those. Whether it's a, a technology um, that you're trying to circumvent, whether it's a, a education awareness program that you're trying to circumvent or find uh, attacks through, the red team is really supposed to be designed uh, to understand what threats face your organization and how you can get better at, at building defenses and capabilities around those. Um, often used as a way to, to identify gaps and exposures in your security program in a way that circumvents them as an adversary would. What I really like is, is and, and this is where I, I, the industry needs to keep uh, focusing on, I'm a huge advocate of these as, as a purple team. I remember giving a talk at, I think it was at Nauticon like six or seven years ago about purple teaming and how uh, collaboration was the most important piece. I think we see with penetration testing, it can be useful in a number of different ways uh, but the collaborative, collaborative approach around working with uh, both red and blue to come out with desired outcomes, both to identify gaps in, in, in our infrastructure and exposures, but also how to build detection capabilities uh, to start to get better at what we're doing are all key concepts that, that focus on the purple team. And I think that's something that, that we should really be homing in on for our customers, uh, what we should be really focusing on as, a, as, a, as an industry and ways that we can get better uh, just in general as we go through and do these types of engagements. And so let's talk about some more definitions. Um, penetration testing. I, I, I hear people talk about penetration testing and they use the word vulnerability assessment in the penetration test. And that, that's one of the biggest pet peeves I think I have in general. A penetration test is still supposed to be a simulation of an attacker. It doesn't mean starting off with a vulnerability scanner and then doing validation with, with different exploitation frameworks. It means trying to identify ways that you can attack an organization, whether it's through a web application uh, or whether it's through a specific port or protocol uh, or a certain type of, of technique or attack. These are all things that, that define a penetration test. It doesn't mean that you can't leverage things like vulnerability scanners, but you're not performing a vulnerability assessment against the company. Uh, and it shouldn't start off that way either. If you run vulnerability scans at the very end to make sure you didn't miss any low hanging fruit, that's, that's a different story. But if you're leveraging those as your main augmentation, that is not a penetration test. If you're conducting a penetration test and you're running a scanner at the beginning of, of an assessment and you're using that as a way to do validation, that is not a penetration test. I'll repeat that one more time. Uh, and the industry should, should recognize that as something but a penetration test is, is often used as a wedge to understand how many uh, direct attack avenues we have in our environment, uh, ways that we can get better at, at monitoring detection, uh, and, and also most importantly, where we might have deviations and gaps uh, within our security program that we think are good, uh, but aren't working. And we see a lot of companies do more frequent penetration tests. Maybe instead of it doing annually, uh, once a year, you do it quarterly or, or bi-weekly, depending on if you have internal groups, testing new business functions, the ability to identify exposures and architecture. Those are all still things that are valid with penetration tests. A vulnerability assessment has its own place as well. Vulnerability management uh, is, is a massive component for an organization uh, to be able to identify exposures and remediate them based off of what's out there, uh, whether we have deviations or a patch management system or just visibility. I don't think I've found a company yet that does a really good job at asset inventory and understands every system that they have on, in their organization. And so if you don't understand that, vulnerability assessment and vulnerability management becomes a very uh, key component to that to have a good understanding around where certain things are at and being able to address those. So they absolutely have their place. Uh, there's different purposes. And then threat hunting is a group really dedic uh, uh, dedicated to understanding 
uh, what's actively happening out there. So if you look at kind of the, the history around incident response, for incident responders, we would, we would go through and identify an incident. We would then respond to that incident and try to identify where those specific breaches came from. Threat hunting is very different in the sense that you're going proactive, looking for edge cases or things that may not get, get picked up in our security operations center. Things that we can look for that, that may be suspicious, such as PowerShell beaconing out to the internet or uh, a specific application bi uh, binary that's going out to the internet as well. These are all things that we can leverage um, to be able to identify and sift through things that make our monitoring detection program better. Again, being more proactive. That's what, what penetration testing is, proactive validation. Uh, those are all key concepts. And all play a role. If you look at, at the different areas, this, this comes down to um, very much a maturity level. And I'll talk a little about that here in a, in a few minutes. But penetration testing uh, is typically used for validation of the program, things that may have slipped through the cracks, and things that we want to identify as part of, of ways of, of actively going into different exposures. Vulnerability assessments, vulnerability management is used to catch that low-hanging fruit and, and uh, baseline for hardening. Whereas red team, uh, the red team is, is the attackers, blue team being the defensive folks, uh, really creating the, that purple team uh, component. And, and in this industry, collaboration is key. I, I walk into a number of organizations where it's either an adversarial uh, uh, relationship between IT or security, or if they are on the same page, most of the defenders don't really understand what the penetration tests do. They just address specific findings. And so working with, with purple teams is a maturity level. It's, and it's typically for more mature organizations. It doesn't need, mean you have to be, but collaboration really yields success uh, in a lot of these different areas. And so if you look at the purpose and value, um, traditional penetration tests really focus on, on exploitation. It's typically fixed time. You only have a few days or a few weeks or a few months to, to actively uh, go and do it. Some people use it for uh, detect, uh, uh, testing their incident, respo incident response program. Um, others find, use it, uh, and it could be a combination of all the above, find as many entry points into the network as possible. Whereas the red team is focused on simulations uh, designed to emulate adversaries that are very specific towards your threat models. And that's used to, to, to circumvent both preventative and detective controls, which I think is important to hit. If we can't move as fast with protection, what can we do detective controls? And are there ways for us to circumvent that and get better at what we're doing? And really, it all comes down to uh, that, that focus on detective controls and visibility to really build capabilities out there. And so if you look at some of the benefits of, of purple teaming, uh, we have collaboration versus destruction. Uh, if you look at, at historically, um, if, if you look at, at penetration tests historically, sometimes they'd be used as a wedge to go in and, and attack an organization to prove all the different things that they're doing wrong to get validation. And that's not necessarily a, a good approach because obviously it hurts us reputationally from a security perspective. Um, but you know, if you look at, at, at objectives of a red team, it's typically to go in and find and gain access to whatever we possibly can and prove that your, your testing's there. We're on a number of a red, uh, red team engagements at a given time, and sometimes you know we'll, we'll, we have red team engagements that span five to six months, uh, depending on how long the company wants us to simulate an attack going after them. And what's interesting about those is sometimes we get in the first week and we're like, ah, uh, we probably need a little bit more work to do, and I'm not sure what to do for the next four months. Uh, but in other organizations that are very mature that focus on these, it's it's very difficult uh, for us to get in. There's a few customers that we have that we spend a substantial amount of time on research. And I'll talk about more research here in a little bit. But we spend a substantial amount of time uh, building out capabilities and attack infrastructure and understanding their capabilities and countermeasures so that, that we can start to build approaches that attack their organization in a way that we're successful. And I think that's the, the fun part, right? Uh, I was on a, a phone call one time with, with an organization and they, the blue team stopped us. And, and I don't think people realize how hard it is as a red teamer. It's not like five or 10 years ago where we could just walk into a company in the first hour, own an entire company and then have full access and then we're done. We, we write the report the second day and then we're coming out with new tools the next day. It's not like that as much anymore. Don't get me wrong, there's, there's definitely immature companies out there, but a lot of these companies are getting much more stronger in what they're doing and it's very difficult uh, for the red team. I mean, it just takes, hey, maybe they look for, for who am I or net user commands from the command line or just spawning a child process of command.exe causes an issue. Those are all things that we have to be super sensitive with now that we didn't have to be five or 10 years ago that make it much more challenging. So we have to be very careful with the profile of the system, go slow, um, use beacon intervals that, that emulate legitimate browser traffic. I mean, it's a very, very difficult process. And that's a great thing. We have some customers where, you know, we did one simulation uh, an attack where we weren't successful. They, they caught us on the very early stages of exploitation. They responded, they, they removed us from the network and we're on a phone call with them and everybody starts clapping and cheering, the blue team won. Now, our goal, obviously, is, uh, from a red team perspective, is, is to win. So hopefully the next time around, we're, we're, we're kicking butt and taking names, and we're the ones clapping on the phone. But it's, it's that collaborative approach that really makes a big difference when it comes to being able to enhance detection criteria 
and really start to get better at what you're doing and simulate really each phase of an attack uh, to get better and better. And so leveraging red um, is is huge. Uh, if you think about it, and I was just on on uh, Security Weekly uh, with Paul Asadorian and, and a number of other folks, John Stran, uh, and we were we were talking about uh, what what we can use as an analogy. And I don't like using analogies all the time, but I, I recently went through some health issues. And just to kind of put it through perspective, let's just take the security industry to a doctor. If you go to a doctor's office, uh, you see a general practitioner. And that general practitioner can diagnose very specific things and, and, and find symptoms so that they can refer you to, to very specific experts in their individual areas, whether it's brain issues and you see a neurologist or a cardiologist for your heart. There are people that specialize in a lot of different areas. And when it comes to, to InfoSec, it's very much the same thing. If we're, if we're just starting off in information security, we probably don't wanna be doing adversarial simulations and trying to build TTPs around very specific attack vectors. We probably have a lot of other issues to focus on first. Maybe that's vulnerability management. Maybe that's a governance structure. Maybe that's identifying our risk and understanding our threats that we can start to build our security program on and what to invest in. Uh, those are the basic concepts there. That's your general practitioner. But as you start to get more advanced and maybe you know you have have more health issues or symptoms, you go to different areas and you see specialists. And that's where penetration testers come into play to start to identify weaknesses. And that's where red teamers start to come into play to, to mature it even further to continuously move your program in different directions. And that's really where a lot of these different uh, engagements or, or types of capabilities that we're developing within, within the security industry are very valuable to companies. Um, we see it all the time and, and uh, we, these are things that, that leveraging red makes things cataclysmically better uh, when it comes to it. And so to put in perspective, there's a, there a company that we started doing uh, uh, purple teaming engagements for uh, about three years ago. Uh, first year, ripped into them. Super simple, easy to get, uh, and, and didn't take us a lot of, of effort. By year three, it's substantially harder for us as attackers. And you can argue that, hey, maybe we're using the same techniques, but that's not the case. We have a whole dedicated research team with new capabilities, and they have other assessors coming in as well. And it's, it's consistent across the board that getting better with security is a direct correlation to understanding attack patterns and, and, and leveraging uh, the red. And so that also comes down to understanding your threat models, which we don't spend a, a substantial amount of time on, which is building out our threats, who they are, the capabilities that attackers may have, and the ways that we should defend against it. I think we know in the security industry that it's no longer possible for us to protect 100% of our enterprise or organization. It's, it's just not doable. But can we minimize the time it takes uh, for, for an attacker to be discovered and minimize damage to our company? And that's really where threat modeling comes into play. And so if you look at threat models, understanding your business demographics and your business is important. Uh, and, and that's understanding where your data resides at, what you're trying to protect, and what's valuable for an attacker. Then going from there and understanding what adversaries or groups are in play, whether it's organized crime, whether it's a nation state, which is a lower, much lower percentage, or it's commoditized malware and ransomware, those are all key things that we should understand from a threat modeling perspective and start to build out our capabilities of the attackers. Uh, that can come from threat intelligence, i.e. Twitter. Twitter is probably the, the number one resource for, for threat intelligence companies uh, pulling their data from from researchers. I think uh, most of the advisories that I've seen in Flash Advisors come from Casey Smith. You should definitely rec recommend uh, following him at SubT. But um, you look at the capabilities that they have and understanding their, their models. And then from there, um, understanding what sources you can use to start to pull in those capabilities and start to build defensive profiles. Uh, and kind of going from there. And then understanding that and building out a threat matrix, uh, building out the, uh, the simulations that you're gonna do against your organization, building out your command and control infrastructure, what that looks like, um, and starting to build out the capabilities and countermeasures you have to, to circumvent those. If you look at the red team responsibilities, research has to be a large percentage of what you're focusing on uh, if you're on the red team. And, and the reason for that is things change all the time. Uh, there might be a new technique that comes out, uh, a new way of attacking, a, a discovery that you, you find as you're researching uh, a specific attack vectors, ways to obfuscate or emulate uh, uh, specific types of traffic. Those are all things that you should definitely be focusing on as far as a, a red team and building out your tradecraft. And from there, um, when you start to attack an organization, identifying exposures, but really building out what defensive capabilities an attacker has uh, throughout, um, or that, that the defensive capabilities that an organization has uh, while you're out there. And so it's really about, about piecing all those all together uh, and being able to handle those. And then from there, being able to communicate those, the knowledge transfer to blue, uh, in, increasing capabilities and, and, and increasing what's actively happening out there in your security program becomes important. And so really the red team output becomes the, the output for your entire defensive strategy. Uh, and that's something that, that I'm a huge fan of and, and where we see a lot of, of heavy success at. And so if you look at these, these are all varying levels of of capabilities that you have um, and maturity levels that you have within your organization. So everything from your vulnerability management program uh, that, that it's used to, to find low-hanging fruit, 
you know, think of this as the the, the bare bones um, basics of being able to identify and stop certain things within your organization. Then from there, penetration testing to identify possible gaps and exposures within your organization or your infrastructure. And then from there, uh, escalating up to red teaming and, and varying levels of programs uh, with different types of, of engagements that you can do to help promote more and more uh, uh, identification of exposures that are out there. And so if you look at some of the old school thoughts out there, um, you look at old penetration testers, glorified penetration testers would come in and smash. It's like taking a bag of Doritos and hitting it with the hammer over and over and over again. Uh, and then taking the fragments up out there and, and trying to piece back together a, a Dorito. And, and that was a tough one because it caused a lot of animosity within organizations early on around, hey, you're trying to find flaws and point flaws out there. And usually a lot of times the identification was, was directly looking at the vulnerabilities themselves um, and not addressing the, the root cause of why they're there in the first place. So for example, let's just say we, we broke in through 16 different web applications. Well, we obviously have a problem in our software development lifecycle. We should probably take a look at how we're injecting security into that and we, ways that we can get better. Um, so looking at the root causes of those and building our programs out, they weren't typically used for that in a lot of cases. In most cases you come in, you'd, you'd hack a co company and come in the next year, you'd hack a company just a little bit differently. You'd hack a company a little bit differently the next year. And again, that's changing and that's a great thing to see. Whereas you look at the new school of thoughts, you know, penetration testing still that 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 leverage points uh, within an organization to be able to identify exposures, uh, but it's also working with Blue to to continuously get better, um, and that starts to build out your red team capabilities when you get uh, more advanced at what you're doing. And let's talk a little bit really quick about uh, the the differences between internal team benefits versus uh, external team benefits. I think if you look at internal teams, uh, there's a lot of of better integration with the Blue team because you work with these folks day in and day out. Uh, you can establish key metrics. You can track those over time. You can show how many different types of techniques you're developing and, and the, the detection criteria that you're building off of that as well. Uh, really the ability to um, uh, substantiate uh, internal knowledge over time. I think that's super, super important uh, within, uh, within um, internal teams. External teams, on the other hand, are usually a lot different. Uh, validation from third party always has more, more weight typically uh, coming from an outside person than it does from the inside. Uh, but also typically uh, external resources may have additional capabilities, things that have better simulations or, or better perspective and views um, based off of seeing different environments and different exposures. Uh, those are all key things that, that external teams have, have drug benefits off of. And there's also stuff called automation testing, which has been a very popular uh, thing as of late. Uh, if you look at like MITRE, uh, uh, the Caldera uh, piece there, the Atomic Red Team framework from, from Casey and the uh, Rick Canary folks, uh, Uber from uh, Uber Meta from uh, Chris Gates. These are all automation frameworks that simulate uh, very specific types of attack vectors. And again, I, I would be, I'd caution you on these. I, I think they're, they're a great uh, step in the direction to get an understanding of these. But if you're just digesting them inside and running them to see if you can detect those, that's a lot different than running and understanding uh, patterns of behavior within an organization versus running automation testing within those. But I think automation testing definitely has a lot of value out there uh, to be able to simulate all of these and see what uh, detections you have but ultimately shouldn't be used as your main criteria. That really only comes from simulations. And I can't focus on, on research enough. Um, this has been a ma major differentiator for us at Trusted Tech, uh, with Carlos Perez coming board, Justin Elzey running our red team, uh, having a team where we can augment our penetration testers with new capabilities uh, that may circumvent uh, tools that are out there, coming out with zero day research techniques that, that we can use for our customers that absolutely need it, uh, and obviously working with responsible disclosure afterwards. Um, Tradecraft becomes a necessity when it comes to targeting organizations uh, because those are ways that, that adversaries are going to go after your organization too. And, and whether it's simulating ransomware across an environment to see how far you can rip through an organization such as NotPetya, uh, or if it's going in and trying to establish command and control that hasn't been detected before, or staying within very specific process chains so that we don't uh, get detected from, from Markov chaining, uh, or ways that we focus on lateral movement that exhibit normal patterns of behavior. These are all things that we should have as far as capabilities, and research has to become the largest percentage of that. I mean, we have a fully dedicated research team here uh, that, that focuses on building new capabilities and attack vectors that aren't out there because we're, we're red, red is hard. Red is getting much more harder for us as attackers, and those are things that we have to do, do to stay ahead of the companies that are out there, and the same thing that adversaries are doing out there as well. And if you aren't developing your tradecraft as far as research uh, and building your capabilities, you're going to fall behind. And it's very difficult to catch up. Uh, you're going to fall behind as far as what's happening in the industry. If you're still running vulnerability assessments and you're performing and calling that penetration test, you're a dying breed. Uh, th those types of organizations from a maturity level are great for, for very small shops that are looking for certain things. But that, that's going by the wayside. You're not going to be able to sustain that business model very long. You need to have experts in those different areas. 
Um, and penetration testing is still an evolution of those attack patterns and staying relevant. You have to have those capabilities. So whether you're just doing penetration tests or doing more longer term red team engagements for simulations, those all require heavy research to be able to conduct those and ways that you can actively go and do it. Some good examples here. I love this one. And uh, Matt did a great job uh, on, on the research for this piece. And if you, if you get a chance, uh, there's a link on the bottom right for, for one that I wrote recently for, from TrustSec, but in there it links the original um, article for Matt. And Matt did some, some research on uh, dot, set, uh, dot setting content dash MS, which is a file extension type. And what's interesting about that file extension type um, is that it's, it's very similar to like HDAs. Uh, if you're not familiar with HDAs, um, they're launched by an, uh, an executable called MSHD, which is an extension that is allowed within browsers. Um, and with HDA files for, the, for a number of years, um, if you had a HDA file being hosted from a web application, it would prompt up and say, do you want to open this website in order to view its content? And you could put malicious code in there to get code execution and to compromise the system. Well, that's that's great, and it's, that was a useful method for us for a number of years, but most companies have gotten very savvy on, on that specific extension type because it's not commonly used. I believe I've only seen it once as a Qualys option. Uh, you can have an HTA as a backup method. It's not used uh, very often, and then Amazon Web Services as well, uh, but again, used as a backup option. It's not primary, so you don't see HTA files um, in, in most cases, and so most folks block those. And so as attackers, we look for other methods to get code execution onto systems, and this was a great one uh, from Matt. Because with the, the dot setting content dash MS extension type, uh, it could be executed within a document or it could be executed within uh, a web application as well. And so those are all key things that were, were super important. So Matt came out with this, um, I think it was like two weeks ago, and he, he led it all the way up to the point of, of showing that, that code execution was, was capable uh, from leveraging calc.exe. And we recently just released a blog showing how you can get uh, uh, code execution through, um, through that as well. So uh, ways that you can leverage those. But interesting enough, going on, on an engagement, if you're, you're simulating red team uh, capabilities, that's something that can be hugely valuable, valuable for you because they're probably not gonna have a detection in place within a 24 hour period or even a preventative measure to stop those by blocking them. Some may, they may be good at that. But in most cases you can get around um, with these. And again, if you looked at the um, Twitter thing from, from earlier from Nick Carr, uh, zero out of, out of 60 were, were reporting that as a specific exposure. So those are ways that you can get around detection and weaponize those uh, to use it. Um, and, and simulate real world attacks, very similar to the DD Auto stuff with, was within 24 hours, I think is being used by Locky, TrickBot, and a number of other ones out there. So things that you can actively do to kind of uh, look at those different areas. And so you look at why research um, and, and risk management is important. Uh, and this, is, this comes down to your foundational security program. The, the first thing you have to do is understand what your threats are and what your risks are towards your organization. And that comes down to understanding your business. And if you're not doing that, you're not focusing on, on a large percentage of what we should be simulating as attackers. That comes into building threat models, uh, that comes into understanding what risks are, are identified within your entire business structure, what we call your risk universe. And I think that's important to understand is that information security is a small subset of, of risks that, that a company has to deal with on a daily basis. And, and ours aren't necessarily the most important in any way, shape or form. There's a lot of other cataclysmic uh, business risks that can happen. So being able to communicate that and build those programs out to reduce risk and road mapping what you need to focus on is really important. Really important. That's why researching and red teaming capabilities and understanding those capabilities to build um, defensive controls is super important with that as well. So long story short, we are getting better uh, at what we're doing. It's, it's interesting to see. It's, it's harder for us uh, from a red team perspective to go completely undetected. And I think that's important to understand is that the industry is getting better and that's awesome to see. It's what, what we want to uh, cont continue to do. We still have a long ways to go when it comes to being able to identify uh, very specific attack patterns or, or abnormal patterns of behavior. The reliance is very much on on technology still. And, and what we've seen from time and time again is that your technology will fail you. Customers that we have that, that do a fantastic job are folks that follow, um, may have a tool that helps them and augments them, but the team itself is, is building out their capabilities and detection criteria within the environment and investigating abnormal patterns of behavior, investigating things that are unusual um, that make the difference and it's the people. And if you don't have the people and you just have the tools, you're missing a huge exposure out there. There's nothing that's gonna skyrocket your program magically overnight by installing the specific tool. It just doesn't work that way. Back to priority again, um, our focus, and I'll, I'll emphasize this again, that our number one priority in InfoSec has to be on detection. And, and that comes into understanding attack capabilities. And that, that comes down to us as attackers being able to emulate that in a way that is real, um, that is valuable, in a way that a company can get better at what they're doing. Just general closing thoughts. I wanted to, to thank everybody for, for coming on to the webinar. I know we're going to do some, some uh, uh, questions here just in a second, uh, and I'll pass it over to Chris. Uh, but again, I want to thank everybody for coming into to the webinar and listening uh, to me talk for about an hour, and uh, let's get into some questions.
All right, Dave, thanks a lot. That was great. I've uh, got some really good questions that have come in. Uh, so we'll get started here with the first. Do you offer or suggest particular tools which enable the ability to make sweeping changes rapidly in response to new zero days? What are the challenges in doing this? So what's interesting is I, I don't think you see as many new zero days coming out at a given time. Uh, they're, they're mostly like techniques or capabilities that are coming out there. And, and when it comes to sweeping changes, it comes to understanding what those techniques are and being able to build it. There's no specific tool out there that will automatically do that for you. Um, it really comes down to the team that you have to be able to research that to, to actively go and do that. And I think having guidance from, from external resources and third parties is important. Um, having the capability to have visibility to be able to do that is important and to be able to respond very effectively. Uh, but there's something out there that's going to automatically do it for you, but the, the people definitely can uh, when it comes to understanding that. All right. Uh, great. Thanks, Dave. Uh, second question, how could new pen testers keep up with such fast-paced evaluation? That's a great question. Uh, for, for penetration testers, uh, you, you have to dedicate time uh, for researching your, your for researching capabilities. And, and that has to be baked into what you're doing either on, on a customer site, uh, built into the engagement, uh, or within having downtime to be able to continuously do research. I spend probably, I would say 30% of my day uh, researching things and understanding new techniques and making sure that I'm staying up to date because it does change so frequently. Uh, or if I'm on engagement, let's just say I, I do a good job and I, and I finish early, maybe I'll home in on an application or a new type of security product that I can start to look at and tear it apart and find new techniques and ways of getting around it or circumventing it. So it really comes down to time management and, and, and focusing on that. I mean, Twitter is obviously a great resource for, for research. I had mentioned Nick Carr, SubT, uh, Manifestation, uh, uh, Matthew Graber, uh, Pyrotech. Uh, so, uh, um, those are all good ones to, to follow. Um, just some great folks out there um, uh, releasing their research for free that you can use uh, to, to help uh, keep your, 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 your research going in, in kind of your field. Conferences are still a great way too. Um, there's some great resources out there that have a number of different uh, uh, recordings of different uh, research topics that are out there that are great to, to kind of catch up on. Uh, it all comes down to, to time management and dedicating time uh, for uh, monitoring it or for, for building out your enhancements of, of your capabilities as an attacker. All right, thanks. Uh, at what company size do you think it makes sense to have blue, red, purple teams? I would say everybody, uh, but that not, might not necessarily make sense. Uh, for, for purple team engagements, uh, and, and, and it could be purple team, let's, let's break this down real quick. Purple teams can be an ongoing evolution where you're continuously doing simulations with your internal teams throughout the whole year, or it can be something that you do more on a fixed time, like quarterly, annually, et cetera. Um, and, and just understanding the benefits of a purple team, you should, you should block off just, as, let's just say a week or two weeks where there's no distractions or anything else. And you come out of there with very specific detection criteria. And that's good for everybody. That doesn't mean a, a, an organization that has one dedicated IT person, you can't sit down for a couple of days and simulate an attack and build a defensive capabilities off of it. Um, those are all things that can that can meet the size uh, and nature of an organization. Obviously, very large organizations may take a longer period of time to actually go through and do things, but you should walk out of that with very specifically new detection criteria through a number of different phases of an attack, everything from the reconnaissance phase and open source intelligence gathering all the way to post-exploitation and exfiltration scenarios. Those are all things that, that should be outcomes of that. So size doesn't necessarily matter when it comes to um, uh, purple team engagements and what you're trying to accomplish with it. Okay, what about detection testing or testing your detection rules for true positive, true negatives? Yep, and that's that's ultimately the, the goal of what you want to accomplish, right? Um, it, it's testing what you believe is there, uh, the validation piece, and making sure that maybe a rule that you have in there is is, is actually working or valid, or are there ways for us to make that rule better? Uh, and, and let's just take an example. Uh, let's just say you, you look for uh, PowerShell encoded command, but there are like a million other ways to get around that. So you can use like exec bypass, or you can just change the execution restriction policies to a different thing, or you don't have to call encoded command at all. You can use... Uh, like Unicorn, which is a tool that I wrote uh, to circumvent those. Um, and so if you look, and that, that's a good example of why Unicorn got, got advanced the way it did. Uh, we were on an engagement with a customer uh, and they looked at every variation for code command. They looked at dash E, dash EC, dash EN, dash ENCO, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so I came out with Unicorn, which uh, um, used to value uh, to convert encoded command uh, and, and splice it up into different chunks so that you couldn't get detected from encoded command. So let's take a look at that and say, okay, well, maybe we can enhance this rule by looking at the length of the PowerShell command, which I, I would say is not necessarily the, the greatest one out there. But other ones like, like, hey, why is PowerShell beaconing out to the internet? Let's investigate those in baseline our environment and put rules in place that uh, are very specific to business cases that we have out there. Um, those are things that you can do to, to test the detection rules to making sure um, that they are effective and that there isn't ways to circumvent them or get around them. And that's absolutely something that you should be doing as part of a purple team engagement 
is focusing on your current detection criteria that you have, making sure that they're actively working, uh, as well as uh, focusing on new ones. And as, uh, as you see more agile development, even building test cases for those to test those out, so you have automatic builds that, that fail or pass based off of detection criteria or things that I've seen very successful uh, in, in a company. Usually there is very little time for pen test. How do you go around the defenses if you have a smaller team? That's a great question. Uh, and, and this is one of the struggles that we struggle with as well. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of companies say, hey, I want a penetration test. We're not ready for a red team exercise. And you have two weeks to, to, to get around all of our technology, circumvent everything and get access to data. I think that comes down to expectations that in a penetration test, you have two weeks. An attacker may have six months. So do you spend an absorbent amount of time trying to circumvent their technology, or do you find uh, try to find as many uh, avenues into their organization as possible? And usually it's the latter, right? Um, maybe we're not going to go and test every single component. Maybe the first day or two uh, we'll focus on, on uh, evasion techniques because it's a lot slower. We have to uh, go a lot more, more uh, stealthy in a lot of cases. Um, so let's just say that, that, that that's the first objective, but after that, Everything opens up and you try to find as many entry points as possible to validate uh, attackers can get access to very specific areas, whether it's getting to a PCI zone to extract uh, uh, um, cardholder information or that's going to, for PII. It, it, all those objectives need to be um, outlined ahead of time to focus on those and go after those in a way that, that there's multiple attack vectors that simulate that. So as penetration testers, your goal may be to, to set expectations that, listen, we can't do all of this in two weeks. If you want that, I'd recommend doing a more longer term engagement and focusing on that, but maybe... Uh, uh, Maybe the first day we try your, your incident response and test your incident response practices, but after that, kind of go from there. So those are the key things that I would hone in on and, and, and talk to customers about, uh, or your organization if you're an internal team, that, listen, we, we're not going to have time to circumvent this based on two-week scope. We have a lot of other things we have to focus on as far as entry points and vulnerabilities and exposures. All right. What are the, some tips for improving an organization's researching capabilities? That's a great question. And, and research uh, is, is a key one. I would say following certain people uh, is, is important, uh, especially uh, high, high, high value ones that kind of keep in the, in the pulse of things. I mentioned a couple of them there uh, earlier uh, before. So, so being able to monitor those, um, but also being able to do your own uh, time to start to develop what you focus on, your own knowledge base. Uh, we're a huge fan here of Confluence, uh, where we share a lot of our knowledge base and our research uh, topics. And we'll keep things in a way where we'll have objectives of like, hey, we want you to have a better command and control. We want to code it in this. And uh, make sure that it has these types of loaders, making sure that you have objectives that you want to accomplish and then making sure that you allocate time to, to be able to do that. Research isn't just about finding new techniques. It's about building your tradecraft as well. Uh, and that, that all comes into what you want to accomplish in your environment and, and spending time for it. That has to be a management decision as well to be able to give you at least 50% uh, uh, time to, to be able to focus on different areas. So, All right. Do you see the use of email as an attack vector to keep growing? Absolutely. Any way that you can reach an end user um, are huge, uh, whether that's that's using email in a way that circumvents their, their perimeter uh, protection, like sandbox and virtualization tools. The ultimate goal is to, to try to get a user uh, to execute code. I mean, obviously, there are other attack avenues to compromising through web applications or uh, going through the perimeter or finding exposed uh, jacks from a physical perspective. I mean, there's a lot of entry points and possibilities of, of attacks, right? Uh, then it just comes down to probability and likelihood. Probably somebody breaking into the facility isn't going to be as, as likely as somebody hacking from the outside internet. Uh, but going through email protection components uh, is definitely something that, that most attackers focus on and try to uh, circumvent and evade as part of that. And those are things that we should be testing as well. A lot of folks have moved to Office 365, and there's a lot of ways uh, to try to attack that and circumvent those practices as well. So absolutely, uh, and whether that's sending an attachment uh, that has code execution functionality in it, or trying to get an attacker, or trying to get a victim to go to a website to either enter in credentials and do things like uh, circumventing uh, two-factor authentication, those are all things that an attacker will typically try to leverage, and, and I don't see that slowing down anytime soon at all. That's, uh, that's still a very high success factor for us as attackers. All right, if someone wants to hire a pen tester, what do they look for today? Where do they start? For, for penetration testing, I think, it depends on what level you want to bring them in. Uh, for juniors, having a foundation in, in networking programming is very important. I'm a huge advocate of, of obviously Python. Um, and, and there's a lot of different programming languages out there. Go is another great one uh, that you can leverage. But having a foundational uh, knowledge around programming and, and things like that, and maybe sending those individuals through uh, SANS courses or the offensive security courses. Huge fan of those, those two folks, uh, the offensive certified, the certified security professional and the security expert uh, components are all key things that I think are really good. Um, so being able to get the right training uh, in place to be able to do some of those. But if you're looking for more seasoned penetration testers, I think having a vast understanding around different areas, but also having a focus on different uh, components. Like maybe for me, for example, 
Um, my, my ways is obfuscation and, and bypassing detection capabilities, right? So that's my area of focus that I focus on a ton of. Um, but in a lot of cases, you, you, I still need to know how to attack web applications. I still need to know how to attack services and, and expose ports and understand uh, uh, vulnerabilities and exposures. So uh, penetration testers, having a solid understanding around those capabilities and having a vast amount of knowledge to be able to attack very specific areas, but also having individual focus areas uh, becomes really important. But I'd say if, if somebody's gone through the OSCE, the Offensive Security Certified Expert, uh, we'll look at them very heavily as pretty much an instant hire. Um, so if you're looking at coming aboard a trusted sec, we have openings, a ton of them, uh, everything from web application testers to penetration uh, testers to uh, incident responders. Uh, we have a number of folks in those different areas. So if you, you're up to there and you have an OSCE, uh, we'll probably look at you very heavily when it comes to that. All right. A typical question over the years has been, what if you don't find anything in a pen test? How have you answered that and how would a company know if they're getting a good one? Well, out of, the, out of the 15 years I think I've been doing this, I don't think I've ever not found something. Uh, you always find something as an assessor, but if the exposures are, hey, you have an SSL version two uh, a certificate or encryption type negotiation, or hey, you don't have a cookie with a secure flag on it, uh, those, are, those are things that you typically see out of a scanner. And, and those are things that, that I think typically you would see uh, from, from a more commoditized um, assessment report. So I would say as an organization, uh, you definitely want to make sure you try to do as best as possible. There are companies that, that don't necessarily find things. Um, a good example is one of the companies that we did assessments for. We still had findings, but we didn't compromise them. That doesn't mean that the, the quality of work wasn't there. It just means that they're doing a really good job, and we have to focus a lot more heavy next time uh, doing different ways of attacking them and trying to go after them in different approaches. So I think it comes down to the level of effort, not being able to define and show the level of effort that you produced and, and what your areas of focus were, uh, and kind of going from there, that, that can kind of show the quality of the assessment itself, even if there wasn't substantial amount of findings. All right. With C levels and boards much more interested in risk, how have you adjusted how you present to them? Example: Are pen tests and risk assessments presenting to, presented together now? I think they should be, uh, because if you look at at understanding an organization's risk, um, you you have a perceived risk and you have an actual risk. And perceived risks typically happen uh, when you think you have a program in place that that is doing something, whether that's Hey, we have security injected into our SDLC and we're doing things great. We don't have any cross-site scripting or SQL injection. Um, or if it's something that is, hey, we're, we do patch management, we're, we're positive of that, we're very good at what we do. The validation components of that and being able to actualize the risk of what an attacker can do um, is very beneficial of understanding where you have gaps in your security program at. So I think uh, combining those and having an understanding around your risk towards your organizations and what those risks actually are, and then the validation pieces of that of where you need to focus really paints that whole picture of, hey, this is where we're at currently today. Here's where we thought we were at and here's what we want to be at. How do we get to that play, uh, piece and how do we bridge that gap to actually um, get our program in a way that we want it to be? Uh, and, and obviously, it's going to be ongoing. We're going to have to continuously change and morph the way that we want to. Um, but having that validation piece, especially when communicating risk, is super important. All right. These are some great questions coming in. Unfortunately, we only have a couple more minutes. So if we don't answer your question, feel free to reach out to us at info at trustedsec.com. Again, info at trustedsec.com, and we can respond, uh, you know, we can respond there. But uh, another great question that came in, Dave, what are the pros and cons of crowdsourced pen tests? That's a good question. Um, so so crowdsourced pen tests, uh, more what we call bug bounty programs, right? Um, and, and I think uh, when you look at, at where that's at, I think there's definitely value um, for some organizations to, to focus on that. Um, I think there's some pros and cons. I think the, the skill levels you can get completely vary. So you may get a good one, you may get a bad one. That could be the same thing for uh, when you go with the penetration test uh, with an organization. Um, a lot of the things that you start to lose, though, is the the ability to build detection criteria off of those specific attacks because it's more of the Wild West going after your organization. So are you truly getting better uh, with detection and defense? Not necessarily for those types of engagements, but you are identifying exposures, which has absolutely has its value. Um, so there are definite um, perks to, to bug buying programs. I think it's, it's very valuable for folks that have more agile uh, type applications and they're building them out. But again, the, the quality um, definitely shifts and changes. I've seen a lot of companies leverage bug bounties and they get just inundated with just false positives all the time, scanners, things that that, that, that uh, come out. They they um, get a lot of things that they have to research and go behind and it spends a lot of time with their team. Whereas if you go with a good good assessment firm uh, that can do those assessments, you don't typically have those. Um, so there's definitely pros and cons to those, I think, uh, of what you're leveraging for and ways that you can definitely uh, see benefits from them, but usually not from the defensive standpoint. All right, thanks again, Dave. Uh, last question here. Do you see differences in the global market situations for cybersecurity, for example, U.S. versus Europe? 
And again, this will be our last one. So any questions we didn't get to, uh, info at trustedsec.com and we'll get back to you. Thanks everyone. Yeah, I mean, I, I think if you look at, 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 from a regulatory perspective, obviously everybody was talking about GDPR and I think we all got 7,000 emails um, around our privacy policies being updated uh, all over the place. Um, but if you look at, at security of where it's at in, in different uh, countries, there's definitely countries out there um, that are so far behind when it comes to information security um, that it's just gonna take a long time to, to, to recoup. But I do see a lot of similarities between uh, the EU uh, and a lot of countries around those areas focusing on there because of a lot of the things that have been happening in the news. Um, everything from from uh, uh, voting uh, tampering uh, to, to trying to throw elections to um, hacking from nation states. Those are all things I think that bring awareness, uh, not just to, to organizations and governments, but also to businesses themselves that are trying to protect themselves. And this is obviously a very global problem and something that we're focusing on to, to try to secure our infrastructure and our systems in ways that we can promote that. I think some countries uh, are just uh, lagging behind when it comes to that as far as a prioritization. It also comes to technology too. Uh, you know, they're lagging behind technology as well. Um, but it's definitely becoming a, a more of a global issue across the board and things that we definitely need to combat, um, especially as we start to integrate technology into everything that we do. Um, it's super, super important. Well, that was it. I think that's the last question here. Chris, Chris looked at me and said, hey, do you want to close it out? Do you want me to close it out? So I'll close it out. Um, but I appreciate everybody hopping on to this webinar. Uh, hopefully you found it useful. Ha uh, email us at info at trustedtech.com or info at binarydefense.com. Happy to help out in any way, with, any way that we can. Uh, so thank you very much, everybody. Have a great day and thanks for listening to me for the last hour.